So, uh, good morning, everyone. Still sleeping, I guess. People are still sleeping, and most of us are still fighting with Bangalore traffic. But yeah, uh, let's start with this thing. So, uh, today I'm going to speak about building for developer experience. So, uh, just to clear things, uh, all the thoughts are mine. They don't represent anything. Like, uh, they don't represent my organization or something. These are just my experience building a design system uh, over last year and a half. So uh, we are building. We are building applications. Uh, but they never used to be applications. They were just web pages. And we used to design them, not build them. In the last decade or so, all the complexity of application had moved from back-end to front-end. And yes, today we build applications. And they are not mere applications. They are experiences which we provide to our users. So uh, I'm going to ask myself, like, how do we actually build application and experience? So uh, let's take a highly contrived example here. And I would say we start with a need a requirement, a gap which our application can fill. So for sake of argument, just say uh, a user needs a swing. And our product team is on it. They started brainstorming. They came up with a perfect uh, swing. They thought of everything, security, robustness, experience, and had a vision of like what a swing would look like. They handed it over to the design team. Design team spent days in, uh, in designing a pleasing experience, a comfortable swing. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. So they thought about comfort, aesthetics, and it was evident in the design. It's ready to be built. Ah, uh, wait. We have our architect team also there. They want to future proof the swing. The architect spent days to create a technical design which can sustain future requirements and grow as requirements come in. Yeah, I guess perfect. We have a robust swing there. Can we build it now? Uh, yes. So uh, we collect all the requirements from different stakeholders and throw it on the design team, uh, on the development team. So the development begins. Uh, but there's always a deadline. <laughs> And deadlines are pretty squeezing ones. The development team cut some corners to get something out really fast. We have a swing. Ah, but user wanted something really simple. We somewhere lost the requirements in thinking like, uh, we, somewhere we lost in the communication what user actually wanted. And the reality was far away from the expectation. Uh, Ask why, why we are so away from what the user actually wanted. So, there are different uh, stakeholders involved in building experiences. There is user who is wanting some, or who needs something, then product who is trying to fulfill all the needs of the user. And there's design who is trying to uh, provide aesthetics and ease of use to the users, and then architect who wants that project should. Uh, live long. It should uh, grow with requirements. And all those people combine everything and put on the poor development team. And they somehow build something. Uh, the development team will start feeling sluggish. Uh, so many people are just throwing requirements at me. And they might leave the company. Uh, another development team will come in and they'll try to improve what they have. They might also feel something uh, like eventually you will get a usable product. So uh, where I'm going with this thing? So uh, when I was preparing for this thing, uh, Janav asked me, uh, where does DX stand in the universe of user experience? Uh, DX, uh, developer experience. So there are three key uh, stakeholders in every experience. There's user, there's product, and there's design. And when they interact with each other, like when user interacts with product, you get understanding, you get requirements. When product interacts with design, we get the interfaces. When uh, design interacts with user, we get experience. And when all three combine, we get developer experience. Like that's the, the white center, the, uh, center, the white at the center is something which is interacting with all the stakeholders and trying to build what everyone is thinking. 
and more the interaction you uh, intersection you get better experience and we have something ready ah yeah so eventually user gets a swing uh, it's not perfect but it's very close to that and this was our component library in 2018 so ah let's get real like th that was everything was hypothetical let's get real with actual examples so in 2018 uh, uh sorry in january january 2017 we started with a design guideline uh, it was called unity and we come up with buttons and everything uh, from design side and we implemented it quickly in react and we started using it was good uh website were looking good design was uh, meant for uh supply chain kind of uses and it worked really well for us down the line within years a new designer come in with new thoughts new thinking new colors and everything and we got different buttons so uh that was the first time when the the system broke and just three months after somebody some well, one more design came in with different guidelines different buttons <laughs> they basically uh i'm taking example of buttons as they are like the primitive thing when we talk about building you a website so just after one year and three months we had three buttons more three months one more button was there one mo next month there are more buttons next was there more button and within a year and half we had so many different kind of buttons it was going out of control everyone was putting whatever they wanted and if we go back and see it started with a small inconsistency somebody came with a new idea new ideas are not bad but if if it's inconsistent it start with a small ripple effect but it's given the time it propagates and hits product as a tsunami so now it blocks the exper user experience and it is caused by a very tiny inconsistency in the system but uh we developers start calling this thing ah the system is legacy is broken and we hate to work on legacy systems we try to move away from those systems and somebody would propose let's rewrite everything ah <laughs> uh, yeah why not why not rewrite everything this uh, don't take me wrong here like uh, rewrites are good uh and but the reason behind this rewrite are unjustified like we actually wanted we we don't want to rewrite we want we are rewriting in this scenario because uh the project feels very legacy as we are far away from the consistent experience what we started from and we don't want to run in this situation is it possible to avoid such a situation yes but uh if you have ever written a piece of code eventually it will grow into an unmaintainable beast and we can't do anything in that respect like uh we are limited by physical laws here a uh, second law of thermodynamics says entropy of an isolated system can never decrease over time so our code is going to be bad eventually so what do we do well uh we can inhibit the rate of entropy we can slow it down we can increase the longevity of software it can run little more so how do we do that uh over last year and half we found something like which help real help us really well most important thing we found was the communication communicating all the decisions all the ideas better can reduce inconsistencies and another thing i found out was visibility uh, i'll go to that i like guess very big visibility is really big then uh accessibility and when i say accessibility i'm slightly different from the uh, general uh, common perceived meaning of this word uh we'll go in detail in a bit adoption and feedback uh, feedback is the most important one so let's start with communication so uh we cannot collaborate without uh, communicating and building products building experiences is a collaborative task so we cannot avoid com communication and 
if we say like uh, communication is kind of basis of human civilization, so we are already communicating for centuries, for millennials. So why I'm talking about this? Yeah, we communicate, but uh, there is ambiguity, and ambiguity in communication results in misinformation. Uh, let's take a scenario. Uh, how often you face a situation uh, when a product manager comes over and says, uh, make this test, uh, text a little bigger? I guess pretty often. And what does it mean by uh, little bigger? What is little there? Is it one pixel? Two, four, 16? Uh, like, uh, more importantly, are we... Our engineers are hired to increasing or decreasing text sizes. Like this is not what we really want to do. And this ambiguity in language results in inconsistencies. So uh, the goal with goal here is to understand what little bigger means and limit it. So we need a common language, a common language which product design and engineers can speak. Let's say we have a common language. Now, if the product manager comes and say, uh, make this font, whatever language, uh, in our language, whatever the little bigger is, but why? Why you make this thing a little bigger? And honestly, uh, you cannot ask why because you don't, even, you don't have a basis of asking that question. There is, there is no ground rule which says this text should be this large or something. So, we have to define some design principles. We have to define all the whys. We have to write them down so that we can move away from unnecessary communication and unnecessary dialogues and actually build product. So, that's what, that's what, that's the first thing we did. So uh, we started with defining all the variables are, let it be colors, sizes, everything. And uh, we did in, uh, started in CSS, like uh, CSS language you're already using. And uh, these values, uh, they are building blocks of a design system. And often people call them design tokens. So tokens become a basis of the communication. And we started looking, uh, Public design, all the public design systems, uh, how they are actually managing tokens. We looked at Atlassian's design system, uh, Polaris design system by Shopify, Lightning design system by Salesforce, and we found like our uh, li Lightning design system talks extensively, extensively about to token management. And our initial implementation was highly, highly uh, motivated, uh, influenced from their implementation. So we started storing in our tokens in. CSS variables. But uh, we needed some configurative. We were using these variables again and again, and we were kind of creating aliases. So this approach in the beginning worked for us, but eventually it presented uh, some problems. Like CSS variable uh, depend on scope of the DOM tree. So you cannot statically determine like if that variable exists in the scope or not. Then the problem was repeating identifiers. Every time we are creating an alias, we are repeating the same identifier, and it adds a weight to CSS payload. Plus, there are runtime failures. You can never know if that variable exists or not at, at the build time. Hence, uh, we thought, uh, let's put a preprocessor in there. And how do we pick a preprocessor? There is stylus there. It's new and shiny. Should we use it? or use post CSS, it's all uh, built upon CSS. You can use that. Maybe less or SAS. There's so many choices, it's really difficult to pick what you need. So uh, we had to understand first like what we actually wanted. So we started like, uh, we need a system which provide us compile time variables so that we can trim down uh, all the identifiers in the final build. We needed something which provides easy reuse of variables. You need something which is stable and has good ID support. And should, it should definitely provide strict compile time checks. So uh, 
you are leaning towards us and uh, then found uh, a found a token management library called account remit uh, it's an awesome library built by Miriam Suzanne and the team uh, it's written in SAS so aligned with our uh, preferred preprocessor and it supported aliasing really well so from this we went to SAS maps uh, and what account rabbit allowed us to create aliases so we were basically referring uh, all the tokens in scope of where they're used like uh, background color and button become namespace button color uh, see button color and background color and it was referring to the primary color defined in the same map so and this is type safe so when we build this thing if that hash primary doesn't exist it will fail at the compile time so uh, we picked SAS and started implementing all the tokens using tokens in CSS like this uh, color is a tiny helper which allows us to access tokens from this color map and we started building everything like that all the padding sizes margins of uh, typography uh, using this thing so the two rules I want to highlight here is uh, account rabbit uh, the old word is the company she works in uh, so this is a really nice tool if you are maintaining your tokens in SaaS and if you want to support multiple platforms and have a centralized token so uh, Theo is really nice uh, it's by Salesforce it allows you to put your tokens in YAML and then export in SaaS CSS for Android for iOS for Windows for F basically everything but uh, we preferred account rabbit because it was aligned like we were building only for web and uh, we didn't want to introduce much complexity in the system so we picked account remit and now we have a basis for our communication we have tokens now when we say uh, make it little bigger we don't, we don't say make it little bigger we'll say uh, make it h4 or make it h1 and that uh, typography style that uh, the height of the font weight the font height color uh, and size everything is defined in the system as tokens so we are talking in terms of tokens but next we define some rules uh, some principles for our language so it was basically a list of do's and don'ts like uh, uh, don't use primary color as text color or don't use uh, dark text on dark background and they were written in plain text and uh, for uh, like for different kind of to tokens we kind of created a static website and it listed down uh, what are they doing so we did this for small tokens like colors and sizes and uh, like when you can use a particular token what does a particular token mean we did it for our components like when you can use a component and how you should use a component and if you're looking for examples uh, Google's material guide does it really well like this is I, I'll say it's the uh, best principles collection you can find on the web they have listed down all the do's and don'ts and with actual examples and screenshot what you should not be doing and this helps really well in having an ambiguous communication so a product manager or designer won't have to come to you tell you that you should not be doing this you already know what is allowed and what is not allowed and uh, our principle cannot be covering everything it's actually an ever-evolving list and I'll come back to the point in the feedback section when uh, the fifth point we dis uh, I showed you earlier so next thing is visibility so uh, you might have heard of a phrase like if it's not documented it doesn't exist and uh, we took the word to its meaning and Followed the same approach like if something is not documented in a system it doesn't exist so how did we land here so we had a drop-down component uh, back in 2017 and it kind of behaved like select uh, HTML select element slight different UI but uh, down so after some time people introduce the designs and do some difference in designs and developers basically started implementing slight different variants and within a year we had 
four components doing exactly same thing with slightly different UI. And, uh, if we had visibility what this top-down component was actually doing, we won't have created all these three components which are actually doing same thing. So we spend lots of time like what should we do to avoid these kind of things. So we started with uh, simply listing down all the components and uh, basically if you need a component you can come here, pick, uh, search for it, if it exists you can pick it and work with it. Another thing we added was we uh, started keeping version numbers like in what version of library you can find this component and what is the status of this component. We define some principle for statuses like what is deprecated, experimental or reviewing or ready and what can be used, when it can be used, what you have to watch out if you are using something. Uh, it really helped us, so uh, it really helped us in better uses, like people could see like what are the components available. And next thing we started was publishing change log. This was really important. Uh, people who are using our experimental components, they want to know what is actually changing in this particular version. Do they need to update in their application? So, uh, our generating, uh, writing change log was difficult. Uh, then we find a tool which can do this automatically. Uh, it's a tool called uh, conventional change log uh, standard version. So, standard version can look at your git commit history and generate a change log out of it. And, but uh, now this added responsibility here. We have to keep our history clean and concise. So, we created again some principles. Uh, as discussed in communication section. So, uh, we, as, so the principles in place were we accept changes via pull requests only. Uh, one pull request can propose only one change. It can be a bug fix, it can be a new feature, it can be a component, it can even be a documentation update or dependency update or some tooling configuration change, anything but one change per pull request. And we started squashing our pull request and followed the uh, commit message guideline provided by semantic uh, commit messaging uh, and we got pretty decent change log which were really helpful in uh, adoption because people could know like what is changing in this particular version do they need to change in their applications or not so then uh, towards visibility what we did we created a documentation page for each component and uh, purpose of this thing was like to highlight all the relevant information required on the component, uh, what is the quality status and where is the source code for this component. And we also uh, included some preview, we included examples which you can look at. Uh, we also uh, provided API, so our system was React based, so we uh, extracted, uh, so uh, we, it was React based and we were using TypeScript. Uh, so we extracted API documentation out of the components and uh, presented in the uh, component documentation itself. And then uh, on project management side we did, uh, for maintainers who are maintaining this design system, we added, uh, f we added few more uh, principles like uh, naming strategy for components. The component should name, the uh, file name should be exactly like component. So if you search in uh, ID, you get only that component. Like all the files related to banner would show up. Uh, instead of using index.ts or something, we are using the file name as component. It, since our, comp, uh, our library has around 50 or 60 component, this cut down, uh, like uh, when you are working on multiple components, you are jumping across files. And this small principle helped us to cut down a large amount of time wasted in switching files. Then, we decided to collocate uh, our documentation along with our source code. Uh, so the readme file you see there is actually the documentation. It has uh, everything. It has all the text and all the examples. And we basically uh, picked this markdown file and uh, deployed it. And all the code examples we embedded in the editor so you can directly uh, see what the code, what, what is the code that is renting that particular example. And uh, let's look into a component. Uh, this is what a component looks like. We had again a small convention like every component should have an uh, 
props interface where we are defining all the props and we are inlining all the documentation using doc comments and this thing is extracted out and can be presented in multiple ways so the tools we use for this thing are, are react docs and typescript uh, it so uh, this library can extract uh, all the prof information from component and we combine it with doctrine to add more information like when this particular uh, prop was added like there's a since tag there on icon so it uh, the doctrine can extract all those tags and we uh, combine this thing to a webpack loader so when we are building our documentation it can attach all the information directly with the component and we can present it in a table like this where we know like, uh, like icon was introduced in version 1.6 and it would be available only when we are using that particular version so yeah this reduces our maintenance effort like we are getting a documentation our documentation all always in sync with our source code if we are making any changes in in a particular component documentation is right next to it uh, we make made sure like you are updating documentation in that same pr uh, next thing is accessibility and uh, the meaning of this word is slightly different here so uh, what I mean by accessibility, like the system should be accessible to everyone. Like, uh, it should be accessible to a product manager, a designer, a developer, or whoever who is involved in the building process. That is why uh, our documentation look like this. There are no code examples here. It just a uh, plain text, uh, like kind of look like an article with some exam examples and previews. However, uh, but our developers need more information and they can basically opt in to see the uh, API there. So who don't need all those uh, technical information can look the component at its face value and understand uh, and use it and like how to use this thing and when to use this thing. And developers can actually go and find the API and basically implement uh, the application using this component. Uh, uh, as I showed earlier, there's an uh, text editor where you can see all the code examples. And since you're writing in TypeScript, we wrote a small script which can extract type out of components. So we can do something like this. We can provide auto completion and prop completion in the embedded ID as well. Mm, I have a small demo. So this is the embedded ID. So when you start uh, typing here, it you provide your suggestions. Uh, yeah. And all the documentation you are inlining is extracted out and put in uh, the browser itself. So uh, tools we had used here was a Monaco editor. It's the editor. Uh, it is the actual editor which is used in VS Code. And uh, we combined with, uh, we use TypeScript compiler to extract types, convert them in a, for, in a form so that we can uh, embed the types in Monaco editor. And uh, we get similar kind of uh, experience in applications. Uh, yes, so uh, this is uh, a recorded demo. So th this is how you would be building an application. You just start typing, it auto imports the components, uh, it suggests what are the props available. Uh, it's suggests what are the components available in the system and auto completes them, auto completes props. Yeah. So uh, it was way better than what we had. Like now we don't even have to jump to documentation to see what we really need. Uh, another example. So uh, this is kind of more of a, this example is kind of what how we are building applications uh, building application actually at Mintra. So we have uh, lots of forms. So uh, this is a form component and uh, it's designed in a declarative manner. So you have to basically do minimal amount of wiring. So uh, this form component uses an object and uses context and all the child information to basically uh, inject all values and on change handlers on the elements. So we design API in such a way that uh, it reduces cognitive over, uh, over overhead on the developers and they focus on building applications, not fighting with the API. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you also try to do this thing. Uh, 
API, uh, API across components should be similar. So uh, when you are using multiple components, you should not focus on like uh, this component uses type for this thing and the other component uses type pro for some other thing. So we try to uh, basically have similar APIs across components. And yeah, that's how we build forms. It uh, looks like plain HTML and we are not worried about how, how this is getting state and all this. You focus on your uh, core logic of your application and and uh, this thing, these things we get out of the box with TypeScript. We just have to wire, uh, wire up the tools in a, in a manner so that we can basically, uh, basically utilize the ID in best possible manner. Uh, this is another example. Uh, so when there, uh, in SCM world, it's just tables and forms. So you build a form and there's a table next to it. That's how our applications are. So again, we created a declarative way of defining tables. So uh, the API is something like this. You tell uh, what you need and you don't worry about how this thing is rendered. So you just uh, create a table, pass the data, then you define what columns you want. And this component takes care of how to render those things. And all those uh, UX guidelines and basically how to render a table, filtering, sorting, can be contained inside this table. You just tell you need a table. And now you actually decide what kind of how a table would look like. The thing with the uh, design system team, and now we can build experiences for them. Another thing we did is we embedded uh, documentation. Basically, uh, we embedded the links to documentation right in the component, and so that you can basically hover over a component and click and go to documentation, see the detailed documentation. Uh, adoption. So uh, we always come up with new shiny things, uh, but business is value driven. Uh, we cannot say this is new, use it. We have to show clear benefits and not everyone is interested in using new shiny things without benefits. So, and build this thing, it was like something like this. Uh, like we have something for you, but uh, all the developers, well, nah, we are busy. <laughs> so uh, adoption is something which is uh, quite a tricky one. So how we tried to solve this thing is like any product. Uh, uh, like every product has a adoption cycle. There are some early uh, adopters who are interested in new things. We identify those in our organization and basically peer program with them, help them to get few applications uh, a few applications on uh, onboarded with our design system before we present it to the larger audience. And uh, we spend like almost six months this way so that we can get few people uh, uh, using our system. And like uh, these kind of things are more prevalent in larger organizations. Uh, for smaller organizations, I guess you can con convince everyone to basically be on board this thing. And uh, while adoption, like we have to most of the time step in, help them, help the, their uh, build their applications. Uh, we did lots of peer programming sessions, training sessions, Q and A's. So we uh, prioritize whatever help the uh, end developers to build application using our system. And uh, once we had few interested developers using design system, we got some numbers. And moreover, those early developers become uh, proponents of the design system. They influence other people in their teams and around, like they were building application faster. And those numbers, like uh, actual numbers are irre irrelevant here, but on an average, you are getting 400 times, 400% 400 uh, reduction in time required to shipping new features. And when we presented this feature, uh, this, these numbers uh, to the organizational people, uh, they were on board. They wanted to do this thing uh, for everything, but uh, tech debt is always a second priority. We have to run business first. So we are still in progress of adoption and I guess it will take another year and a half to have everything in Vintra on the design system. Uh, toward the end, I want to talk about feedback. So we had created so many things uh, like uh, we have principles, we have tokens, and we want everyone to adhere to them. 
it is possible that whatever we decided could be wrong. So we are, uh, the first principle in our design system was to embrace feedback. So uh, anything can be changed, but there's a proper channel. You have to convince people and you can change anything. So if you feel something is wrong, uh, you have to basically communicate about it, give a positive feedback and basically uh, whatever you are trying to introduce, what you are trying to change should become a new principle. Uh, another thing in these feedbacks, what we had was we were not deleting old principle. Like you come up with a principle which kind of supersedes the older one. So here, uh, we didn't want to delete that thing. Like that principle come out of a discussion uh, and we don't want to lose that information. So we created a uh, a decommissioned principles list where we were putting all the deprecated ones so that in future you basically go to the uh, go back to the same thing and you can find like uh, we already dis did this thing we don't have to basically fall in the same pits again and reach to the same conclusion so we can use this information this information was really valuable and uh, it helped us to shape our system so like in the beginning we started with very minimal things we started with a button and through various uh, feedback cycles, we reached to a place we have now 60-ish components which are being used on more than a dozen of applications. So, uh, uh, it's all done here. Uh, just quickly revise the things we uh, talked about. So, communication, uh, we define tokens, reduce ambiguity, and use principles uh, to basically uh, reduce uh, involvement of people in decision making process and we listed down all the principal as plain text on the website and we use a cow for token management then we talked about visibility it was about providing uh, so making the information available to everyone we use a combination of handwritten documentation and generated documentation use react doc gen doctrine and standard version for release management we talked about uh, accessibility it was making all the information available to developers and everyone in their relevant environments at their fingertips. They don't have to jump through multiple hoops to get the information. Uh, we talked about adoption and uh, the key thing I could get here is like get some in uh, initial users so that you can get some matrices to show and to show the benefits and basically get everyone onboarded. And feedback, uh, listen to everyone and keep iterating. So I uh, tried to summarize my last year and a half at Menta in this talk. I hope you get something out of it. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Rahul Kadyan. You can find me on Twitter with this handle. I rant about tech, JavaScript, view, design system, local communities, diversity. Uh, so maybe follow me. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, we have very short time, only one or two questions uh, right now. Hi, uh, I'm Tirtha. So uh, the question that I have is, uh, suppose you have said 27 applications consuming your pattern library, yeah. component library. So uh, how do you manage that you are on component library version 1.x and then um, you come up with some more complex UI elements that's kind of is going to bring in breaking changes mm -hmm. and you release version 2.x mm -hmm. and some newer application has taken 2.x but the older application also wants to upgrade. How do you take care of that scenario? Because that is going to be too much overhead on the you know the older applications. Uh, yes, uh, so the approach we are going here is like you're trying to reduce the number of breaking changes we introduce. Uh, like, but they are inevitable. So uh, the thing we are trying right now, and like I haven't uh, talked about this thing, we are trying to have uh, CDN deliveries. So you can lock onto a particular version, and uh, we won't ship anything breaking in that. And you don't even have to build your applications again when we ship a new version of library. You automatically get it. But for breaking changes, uh, we are providing migration paths. We are using uh, this tool called. Recast to basically create code modes so you can apply those code. So whenever it can be automated, we provide code mode so that it can be automated. Uh, the migration workflow can be automated. But until now, we haven't introduced something 
which uh, really breaks uh, in the existing components. Hello. Uh, so you gave an example of uh, multiple versions of select component. Yeah. How did you finally move to a single component and uh, was it a hard move or a soft move like gradual transformation or did you change everything at once? Uh, so this was kind of, uh, in initially this system was kind of break everything and start from scratch. So how we are building right now is trying to contain the UX decision inside the library and give flexibility to, to uh, basically compose together all uh, the UI you need. So uh, just take example of the drop down or the select component. Now uh, the logic of selection is thing in one component. Uh, the logic of list and drop down is another component and you can compose those two or three components to create uh, what kind of view you need in, in your application. And all those views are already uh, uh, well tested by design and development team. So uh, we have like uh, clear examples, like if you want that kind of uh, drop down in your application, you have to use it in this way. So it kind of creating patterns out of the library. So uh, you can basically pick this pattern and put it in your application. You don't have to worry about how this thing is going to be. Uh, like the end goal with the system was to provide all the developers uh, with tools good enough so they can focus on their uh, business logic and leave all the UI and UX related stuff on the, uh, on the design system team.